Okay. Oh, Emily put the head yesterday. I don't know what she put. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Can I get a thumbs up if everyone can hear me? All right, so you can hear me. Uh, my name is Eric Estevis, and I'd like to welcome you today uh, to our informational session. Uh, I'm the executive director of the Lenny Zakem Fund. Um, this is an informational session about our 2021 grant cycle. So uh, this is being recorded and the recording will be shared um, for those who may have registered but were unable to make it. And I am going to start sharing. So I'm sharing my screen. Um, just want to thank all of you for being here today. Um, and really, this will be fairly quick. It will take up less than an hour. Just wanted to provide you some uh, overview information about the Lenny Zakem Fund, what we're all about, um, about what the types of organizations that we typically fund, and also um, our, process, our process currently. So the fund was uh, established in 1995 by Lenny Zakem. Uh, you may have driven across the Zakem Bridge. It's named after the same man. Uh, he was a local civil rights activist, uh, former head of the um, New England um, ADL. And uh, really he was all about um, empowering grassroots organizations. And our mission is really focused on addressing social, racial, and economic justice. The Zakem Fund has seven primary funding areas that in essence are pretty all encompassing. Access to food, housing, and economic security, child and youth development and education, civil and human rights advocacy and support, health promotion and accessibility for all, LGBTQ community support and organizing, organizing and support for immigrants and refugees, and lastly, violence prevention, criminal justice reform, and family outreach. So while not everything under the sun, a whole lot of things. The grantees that we typically have funded over the last 25 years, um, our organization is led by people from the communities they're um, impacting. Uh, we have a very laser focus on small grassroots organizations. So that means that um, the budget, the upper limit of budget sizes is currently 350,000. Um, so you may have noticed in the guidelines, if you are at or approaching 350,000 in terms of your budget size, you may want to just reach out. So depending on the volume of applicants, uh, we do skew towards those organizations that are smaller in size. You have to be located uh, with significant work in Eastern Massachusetts. And given the budget constraints, usually those organizations have little or no full-time staff. Some are mostly volunteer run, some have several staff, but uh, still small in size. Um, and to give you some numbers, um, so over the last 25 years, we've funded uh, more than 400 organizations. Uh, this $614,000 number here is for 2020. Uh, that was our annual grant amount for 55 grantee organizations. Um, however, this year has been a banner year for us in terms of grant making. Uh, unfortunately, due to the COVID-19 pandemic and crisis. So in addition to our normal grant making, we were able to raise and then have granted out close to 350,000 in emergency grants which means for 2020, this is the first time in our 25 year history that we've exceeded a million dollars in total grant making. So just to, I uh, just wanted to provide that to give you a sense of our numbers. Uh, let's see, next slide, all right. Um, so in terms of the process, our guidelines are provided on the website um, as well as in fluid review. Uh, which is the online tool and system that we use um, to manage the application process. Our grants range from a, usually about $1,000 as a lower end up to a maximum of $20,000. So we're, while we're not a huge funder, uh, we do um, have a particular niche where we focus on small grassroots organizations and also provide more than just funding. And I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, 
another thing that's um, unique to us is that our, our organizations are eligible for up to five years of consecutive funding. You'll see it says pending review. We've even streamlined our processes even more this year so that it's really, a, you know, essentially considered a multi-year grant for up to five years. And the reporting process is now going to be a part of the renewal application, um, as opposed to having um, current grantees reapply every year. And most, if not all, of our support is unrestricted general operating. So that's really been our focus to not be too prescriptive in what we're funding, but really recognizing your need. And once kind of you, you, you're, you, an organization moves forward to be funded, um, not dictating what those funds to, are to be used for. However, we do not support the following things conferences, sponsorships, uh, film, video, or print projects, requests from individuals research, development, or planning grants, and capital campaigns. And I'll, I see a couple of questions are popping up in the chat, and I'll get to those um, shortly. One of the other things that the Zakem Fund has been known for many years is our capacity building support. So in addition to the grant making, we offer, um, we offer several types of capacity building support. One is technical assistance training. So we offer a variety of workshops, seminars, and professional development institutes uh, each year where we offer um, trainings uh, that are facilitated by expert guest speakers, some of whom are nonprofit and grassroots leaders themselves on a variety of topics. And those include things like financial management, fundraising, uh, board governance, um, recruitment, marketing, so a host of kind of functional skills and nonprofit management topics that are essential for organizations to grow and thrive to, be, to become stronger and also ultimately seek out even larger funders. Another thing we offer through the support of our host, DLA Piper, which provides our office support and back end, is pro bono legal services. Um, so that's something that several of our grantees or grant recipients over the years have uh, utilized and benefited from. Uh, and it's something that we're able to offer through DLA Piper. Uh, also, we provide mentoring and coaching. So uh, this uh, in June, we wrapped up uh, and concluded a, a program called the Transformational Leadership Cohort Program or TLC for short. And really was a, a program focused on cultivating and developing leaders of color or from marginalized group um, to help really enhance their leadership skills. Um, and then also we do some kind of more one-off mentoring and coaching as well outside of the program. And lastly, networking. We try to be as helpful and, and useful as possible to our grantees um, by connecting them to other um, organizations, resources, consultants, donors, and networks, et cetera. So for the grant application process, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, the applications currently are due September 1st. So if you've applied before, this is kind of a later date than, than we've had in the past. Uh, so essentially on, on the back end, we've condensed our time frame um, and, and put September 1st as the deadline for applications. And that's really stage one. Um, after stage one, um, we kind of make preliminary decisions and then move towards a site visit stage. This year, as you may have expected, site visits likely will be Zooms or uh, phone calls. If you're not Zoomed out already, um, just know that that likely will be how we handle site visits this year. And site visits, uh, we, try to, we try to engage in a process called participatory grant making, where we have not only board members and staff as a part of our site visit and grant review process, but we also have external community members. So we're also seeking um, new additions to our, what's called a community investments committee, so that we have more and fuller representation um, of people doing those uh, site visits and reviews. And lastly, our final review stage, stage three, uh, concludes at the end of January. And that's really because we're, we're not a typical foundation. Uh, the Zakin Fund is really a public charity. So we do fundraising in order to do grant making. So once the year concludes, uh, we do an assessment and are able to make the final grant decisions for 2021 at the end of January. And then um, nonprofit organizations hear from us 
as soon as possible after that final meeting is concluded. So this is kind of just a visual uh, representation of that grant process with the initial stage, um, applications, um, and then the site visits, calls and meetings, and then a final review, and then decisions in 2021. The grant application is pretty straightforward. Uh, we've even tried to um, streamline it this year so that there's less information that you have to submit. Our hope is to continue to do so over the years so that it streamlines the process. It minimizes the burden on you in terms of how much information needs to be submitted uh, in order for us to do a proper uh, review. So the cover page and request form really acts for kind of basic organizational information, mission contact info, uh, categories and where you serve. Uh, we try to be uh, uh, representative of different communities, but also um, uh, enclaves in Eastern Massachusetts. So you may notice that we fund heavily in the Boston area, but also we have organizations that we funded in Gloucester, Lowell, Lawrence, New Bedford, uh, Worcester, Attleboro, Fall River, and Brockton. So pretty expansive. Um, so we, we try to be intentional and pay attention to where you are located or at least where you provide your services or programming. And also if you are fiscally sponsored or not. And then our narrative, narrative questions ask things like what is your, what is the focus of your work? What type of programs do you run? Um, how many people do you serve? Uh, and then the budget information really is about your PL, so your profit and loss statements. Uh, if your fiscal year ends June 30th, you only need to submit one. Um, but really, it's to get in a, a sense of your financial health. So, in one way, we look at that information to assess kind of where you are as an organization. But we also start looking during the application process towards organizations that could stand to benefit from some of the capacity building training and workshops that we offer. Uh, we also asked for staff and funder information. So the staff and board information is really, um, it captures kind of um, the health and governance of your organization. But for us uh, to be transparent, it's about also collecting demographic information. We want to try to ensure we have a good sample of organizations that are being funded in our portfolio that are represented by people who are reflective of the communities being served. Uh, if you may have noticed in the guidelines for 2021, we also have a priority on organizations led by people of color or who have more than 50% of people of color in their leadership roles. Uh, that's not to the exclusion of non-people of color, but uh, we just want to be more explicit in um, a funding priority of ours that has always existed, but wasn't necessarily always spelled out. The timeline is uh, provided here below for those who can't see it. Uh, this is the second grant information session today. Applications are due by September 1st, and then September through December is really kind of our review process. Uh, and again, we it's not just the staff or the board that's doing the reviews. We engage other external community members and committee members to do a variety of reading, phone calls, site visits, and many of those will be virtual this year. For current grantees, their grant reports are due in mid-December, which then serves as their renewal application. And then early February is when we do a notification of um, 2021 grants. And you may have heard that annually we have an award ceremony, which was unfortunately canceled this year, um, because it was you know, just two weeks before everything shut down here in Massachusetts. Uh, but currently we are planning for February 25th uh, to have an award ceremony again. And that's really a way to recognize um, our 2021 grant recipients, provide kind of some extra uh, media coverage uh, for those grant recipients, but also highlight the work of some of our um, uh, nonprofits as well. Fluid Review. So Fluid Review is the online tool and system that we use. Um, you may have already accessed it and set up an account, uh, but really it's our grant portal. 
um, you, you create an account using an email address, um, you create your own password. Um, our, the uh, URL or the web address for it is lzf, which is our initials, dot fluidreview.com. And we highly recommend that you do not use Internet Explorer. Uh, with Fluid Review, if you do encounter any technical problems, you can try reaching out to the Zagum Fund staff, but we highly suggest you contact the Fluid Review uh, help desk because they're very responsive, but they also kind of just have all the information and answers to anything, any technical glitches in Fluid Review. Uh, in Fluid Review, <clears throat> you'll notice that it asks for different um, buckets of content. We, we break it up so that you can also track your progress. It tells you when something has been started or not, and then when something is completed. Um, so as things get uploaded, it's a way for you to keep track. It's almost like an online checklist as well for what information still needs to be submitted in order to complete your full application. So now on to some frequently asked questions before I open it up to questions from the chat and then um, in live as well. Um, one question is my organization's budget is over or nearing 350,000. What are my chances? Um, a very upfront answer is slim. So again, I, I shared earlier, we skew towards small grassroots organizations. Um, so I think on a prior, prior slide, the average budget size is less than 200,000. So, you know, when we factor in the totality of all of the applicants and, and kind of those who go through the process, uh, those who are on the, um, the higher end and closer to 350,000 probably have a, a less likelihood of being funded. Uh, the TA that we provide, the technical assistance, includes workshops around uh, finance, uh, around um, board governance and board responsibility, especially uh, fiduciary responsibility, fundraising. We've offered some workshops around that already, um, uh, marketing, and, and also program management as well. Uh, how much money should I apply for? We don't prescribe that. We give a range. You can apply from between 1,000 and 20,000. That's our upper limit. Um, uh, in the guidelines, it provides kind of some numbers around average grant size for new and current um, grant applicants. Um, but we don't prescribe how much you should apply for. Um, we, we, we urge you to kind of um, come up with the number that makes sense for your organization. Uh, if you don't have a board approved current fiscal year budget, I highly recommend uh, submitting what you have and work, work uh, working from. Um, and then lastly, uh, if your fiscal year ends June 30th, no, you don't need to send both um, a year to date and a full year profit and loss statement. Um, so just one um, of those should suffice. And with that, um, I'll leave this last slide up. It says, please contact us at office at org. And what I'll do is open the floor up to questions. So um, please give me a second and I will start going through some of the questions that have been submitted. Um, so if our budget is 300K, should we reach out? Uh, yes, I think it, it's reasonable um, to reach out. Um, my colleague, Dominique, is also on this webinar and is available and we, we um, both check the office email address um, to schedule. We can schedule a quick call just to touch base. We don't, um, we don't uh, turn down anyone from applying. You're welcome to apply, but really for us, it's just providing kind of a heads up around just so you know, you know what our numbers look like in terms of average uh, budget sizes for those who do end up getting funded over the years. Uh, if we have a fiscal agent, are we eligible to apply? Yes. Um, any organization that either has its own 501c3 status or is sponsored by an organization that has 501c3 status is eligible. Um, uh, we just recommend providing both your own budget de details and that of your fiscal sponsors so that we can clearly distinguish between the two. Uh, if our program is new and we haven't reached 150,000 as of yet, are we eligible to for the grant opportunity? Um, 
So yes, that's yes, 150,000. Yes, that's under our budget cap. Um, you you are eligible, and you don't necessarily have to have a fiscal agent if you have your own 501c3 status. Another question is, <clears throat> if our mission includes significant port portions of multiple mission areas found in the grant application, should we just pick one of those areas? Uh, yes, you can just pick one area. Um, you, you don't have to, uh, we don't want organizations to feel like they're being pigeonholed. Um, if there's an area that most represents you, um, I believe there's an option to select multiple. Um, but we, we, we're not prescriptive of what mission area you should fall under. Uh, we try to be mindful of the balance of organizations that do get funded and that fall into um, our mission areas. But sometimes we have mission areas that have um, much more organizations funded than other areas. And that's also just uh, due to the nature of uh, the work and the programming that exists. And you know th that fluctuates each year. For example, this year we might see a whole lot more around uh, health um, given COVID-19. Could you describe in more detail what is meant by bottom line budget numbers? Um, I don't think I'm clear on what you mean by bottom line budget numbers, um, but essentially the budget that your organization is working from um, as you kind of, you know, assess your budget to actual, um, that that's the type of information we look for. So, you know, what was your budget and then how does the budget to actual compare? Uh, thank you for the transparency around who you're looking to support. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, I have, tr another question is, I have tried to set up an account in order to obtain a grant application, but I never received an email. When I tried the second time, the message stated I already have an account, please advise. Uh, so yes, so with that, uh, feel free to reach out to us at office at the LennyZakenFund.org or the Fluid Review Help Desk. Um, and we can try to take a look, see if maybe there was a typo or some sort of glitch, um, but you should have received an email. Um, and then also you might wanna check your junk mail folder just in case, uh, because when you, um, Sometimes when people create accounts for the first time, it may end up in that junk mail folder um, as an unrecognized sender. Uh, we are looking for continued funding for a program for September 2021. Could we wait that long to utilize the funds? Uh, yes, so when you are funded uh, by the Zacom Fund, they come in as unrestricted general operating support. So we, it's not that we don't care what you're using the money for, but we are not prescriptive in that uh, the funds is the funds are for your organization to run its programmings. Um, ideally, it's being used for during the 2021. Um, so when it's used during 2021, it's not something that's up to us, but it's it's really. Um, you know, our motto is around trust-based philanthropy and really trusting you to put the money to its best use. Uh, when will this recording be shared? Uh, as soon as we can get it downloaded and edited and uploaded. Um, but we'll, we, uh, in our last info session, we um, did that and shared a link with everyone who registered, um, I think within a day. Um, and then also the, the recording of a prior info session is already on our YouTube page currently. Uh, next question, can you give some kind of idea of how likely it would be for orgs who have applied in the past and have been denied to then get funded after reapplying? Um, so I guess the likelihood is hard to estimate in terms of probability. I think, you know, for us as an organization, our board has evolved. So um, more recently, to be transparent, we 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 lost, uh, I think, a total of eight board members in the past year um, and have added a few more. So we have kind of new eyes looking at our grant application. Uh, we have kind of new priorities and urgency and a sense of urgency in, in some issue areas that have come up. So it's hard to give a, 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 a pure 
likelihood or probability. Um, I think it's, you know, for example, it, it depends on almost on a case by case basis. I had a conversation with a, a organization yesterday who had applied previously and been denied to really get a sense for what's changed. So, you know, if you're an organization that um, applied before, um, what we try to do and strive to do is give feedback um, when organizations are denied uh, on, on ways in which they could likely strengthen their grant application. While I wasn't here for the prior process and years before, um, we certainly can try to go through, you know, old documentation to give a sense for how might your grant application be improved so that it either you know, provides more clarity because sometimes a denial is based on clarity or a lack of detail um, or, or, you know, just some content that may have been missing that would have added a fuller picture of your organization. Uh, another question is, I have an account on Fluid Review from other foundation applications. How do you get a login specifically for this grant? I would uh, reach out to us via office at the Lenny Zakum Fund. Uh, we can see if we are able to find you in our system. If not, that would be a question for the Fluid Review help desk, whether you can use the same account on for multiple uh, funders in fluid review. That I'm not sure, but they can certainly give you an answer around that. Uh, another question is, what are the expectations for site visits for organizations that don't have a physical site or virtual site to join? So for site visits, uh, well, well we, we have the uh, Zoom capacity to, to set up virtual site visits. Um, physical site visits probably won't be realistic, uh, at least until next year. So. Uh, what we plan to do is kind of work with applicants to find a mutually convenient time to schedule a site visit. Uh, and even in the past, when we did physical site visits, we, you know, and, and speaking for myself, it's not a dog and pony show. So uh, you don't have to feel like it's a performance, but really it's an opportunity to share what your organization does is all about what type of programming you offer and it's really to, to for us to have a fuller sense of you know what's going on and in what ways would being a part of the Zakem fund network be uh, useful and beneficial uh, another question what if we apply for a certain amount and the fund decides not to fund that amount will lzf possibly fund a portion uh yes so we we tried to pay attention to the funding amounts that come in as requests, but often we are not able to fund at the full uh, requests of everyone who applies. So uh, funding at the full limit of what everyone requests um, often means that we can fund far fewer organizations. So we try to balance it out. Some organizations likely will get the full amount of their requests. Many organizations get a, a number that's uh, lower. So we strive to fund at least 50% of um, what was requested. Uh, we also try to pay attention and um, be attuned to things like budget size in comparison to the quest amount. So those are things that we, you know, and, and I have looked for in the past when I review grant applications. Um, and it's not, you know, not to um, put organizations at a deficit, but really just balancing out the reality of our funding capacity. Uh, another question. Uh, that's more, I guess, detailed, so I can answer them directly. Uh, is this the only grant cycle you have in a given year? Yes, we, we typically only have one grant cycle per year. Um, and then we do other things as well. So we have our um, capacity building grants for those in our leadership cohort. This year, we had our emergency fund. Uh, in past years, um, we've had an emergency, emergency grant pool of funding available. Um, for kind of unforeseen emergencies. It was, you know, it certainly expanded in, uh, exponentially this year, um, but typically our regular grant cycles is just once per year. Um, and then organizations that are funded become a part of our network and then have access to the trainings and workshops throughout the year in the network. 
uh, a significant amount of our budget is in kind. Should we include those line items as part of our overall budget? Uh, yes, that's 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 helpful information and useful to know. Uh, we similarly, the Zakem Fund has some in kind um, items on our budget as well. So, um, just providing the detail behind what you know what those in item in kind items are um, certainly adds um, better context to your application. Uh, another question, and sorry if I'm getting to the questions slowly, but they're coming in fast and furious. Uh, our program approached 335,000 last year, but this year will be much less due to COVID. Uh, would that fact go into consideration when looking at our budget as we normally would be considered a 330,000 organization? Um, I would say, um, yes, we, we, we certainly, uh, factor in all kind of uh, changes and adjustments in, in ways that your organization may have had to pivot. Uh, even our, my organization as well, we had to reforecast our budget um, down from what our original budget was. So if there's a reforecasted budget that you're really working from now, uh, I would I would urge you to, to also include that information as part of your narrative in the budget details that you submit. Because the reality, many organizations have contracted in size in terms of their budgets um, and are working with um, a different set of um, circumstances currently. Uh, another question, are you accepting requests for challenge grants this cycle? And if so, what kinds of organizations would you recommend requesting them from? So if you are interested in the challenge grant, you can indicate that. Um, we, don't, we don't have a particular um, uh, opinion on what type of organization. Ideally, you want to have the ability to be able to leverage a challenge grant. So either you have a strong kind of online uh, marketing or social media presence or um, you know, it's, uh, some sort of donor base that is inclined to support challenge grants. But um, we, we don't prescribe who we would recommend requesting one. But if you are interested in one, you can indicate that. Uh, there's a question about, uh, to follow up about the funding limit question, <clears throat> what are you looking for in terms of applications that receive full funding? Is it based on need or that it meets more areas that you focus on? I would say that probably varies. Um, so I guess to start in an answer to that question, we recognize that some organizations have development staff and some organizations don't. So we try to be mindful that a strong grant application may be well written because the person had the time to really focus and dedicate it to it. Whereas um, some that previously may not be a, um, what, would, what may be considered well written is really due to the demands that are and the burden that is placed on that person doing the grant application. So for us, it's the, it's the total package of not just how well written a grant application may be, but what the nature of the work is, and also the kind of impression of the impact that organization may be having on its community or population served. So um, that doesn't, I guess that doesn't necessarily give a strong answer to your question, but it, it really is about, um, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a case by case basis. Uh, that's why we try to have a representative group of people doing the reviews um, so that if an organization is strongly regarded, um, you know, that that may also add to that possibility of full funding. Uh, another question. Uh, could we use the funding to pilot a new element of our program or could we use it to pilot a new program? I think similar to a prior question, our funds are primarily unrestricted general operating support. So yes, it could be used to fund um, whatever program you have, whether it's new or not. And my apologies, the garbage truck is right outside my window. Um, but yes, we unrestricted general operating support, so we don't prescribe what program it should be used for, whether it's new or existing. Uh, all right, that looks like all the questions that I see in the chat currently. 
I will stop sharing my screen and then go to the uh, gallery view and feel free to raise your hand if there are, I haven't seen any more questions in the chat. Um, and I can call on someone and unmute you if you have another question that I didn't get to yet. And I'll give you a little bit of time. I don't see any hands, but I want to be respectful of people's time. So I'll, like an auctioneer, I'll say, go on once, go on twice. And that'll conclude today's informational session. Um, we'll be sure to get this um, downloaded, edited, and posted to our YouTube. And we will share a link. Um, as well as a PDF of these slides. And feel free to reach out to us, uh, myself, um, or Dominique, Dominique, can you wave? Um, if you have any further questions or there was something that we didn't um, answer uh, thoroughly. And with that, I hope all of you have a wonderful day. <laughs>